as well as the plans and initiatives of the Department of Education in fulfilling its mandate of delivering quality and accessible basic education for all. The Department of Education has been intensifying its partnerships with our external partners to ensure that the challenges of education will be addressed. To further understand the current challenges of basic education, may we request everyone to direct your attention on screen for an audio-visual presentation. The challenges facing Philippines basic education today did not happen overnight and will not be solved overnight. Overcoming them requires sustained national political and societal commitment from the highest political levels to all members of the society. Of the many elements of the education system that will be given the current situation, I would like to focus on two main ones. First, the choice of language instruction. The decade has adopted the mother tongue based multilingual education policy in 2014. Although the policy is fairly aligned with international good practices, but has faced in implementation challenges. Second, the demand of education faces a severe backlog in school infrastructure, which is a result of historic underinvestment but also bigger damages from natural disasters such as typhoons in those space. Learners face the stigma of violence in different forms, both in prison or via digital platforms. A number of children are coping lonely in school. Furthermore, only a zero believe that the real ability in intelligence can develop or not. The broader scale, children engaged in child labor, especially boys, increased to 68% in 2020. Teenage pregnancy continues to be one of the major reasons for dropping out of school. Children affected by natural disasters and conflict also suffer reducing days in school and decreasing their ability to learn because of profound stress. All these factors lead to significant time away from school. This will dampen the country's low long-term economic development prospects. to 12 intended curriculum has a large number of learning competencies compared to the amount of teaching time available in a school year. Students could not keep up with the pace of the curriculum given their low access to learning resources, 
In terms of the implemented curriculum, research data show that teachers do not have time to teach all the allocated learning competencies. For the tested curriculum, the national achievement tests are aligned with the content of the intended curriculum. However, the cognitive demand of the test items was found to be high and would challenge the knowledge and understanding of most students. The review of the attained curriculum showed that learners are not reaching the levels of knowledge and skills expected by the intended curriculum. This starts in the early grades and goes to senior high school. Graduates of the K-12 curriculum lack the foundational knowledge and skills expected for higher education and employment. Teachers are the single most important in-school factor in a child's learning achievement. Teacher quality begins in the pre-service education delivered by the teacher education institutions. So great care must be taken in ensuring pre-service teachers receive exemplary training. Currently, the implementation by TEIs of developmental training programs from pre-service to in-service is weak. Lasting improvements in basic education will not be possible until the challenge to make substantial changes to improve pre-service education is met. Another issue identified by the studies of RCTQ and World Bank is that in-service training is currently not meeting the needs of teachers, lacks coherence, and is not delivering the learning gains the country needs. Our teachers also suffer from lack of a strong system on career progression. Our work with stakeholders serves many issues on employability of graduates, the lack of collaboration among government, industry, and academia. On the industry side, while many companies are open to accepting SHS graduates, many job applicants still lack life skills. We need to ensure that these skills are well integrated and taught well in the early stages of basic education. We also sought to stop the stubborn practice of employers requiring college units or diplomas for minimum wage jobs by encouraging them to hire graduates of tech work programs or train senior high school learners. While tech work is one of the many tracks that K-12 offers with the promise of employability, its potential remains underutilized. The Filipino learner's journey in basic education is challenging, especially for the most vulnerable and marginalized. But the fact that we are gathered here today is a testament that we are ready to face the challenges together. Thank you, everyone. To give us the Basic Education Report 2023, may we call on Vice President and the Concurrent Education Secretary, Sara Z. Duterte. Marcos Jr., distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, malayaw o maayong adlaw ka ninyong tanan, magandang araw sa inyong lahat. Sa bahay, bilang ina, kasama ko, namumuhay ang apat na uri ng learners. Isang kindergarten, isang grade 4. Isang grade 3, grade 7, at grade 9. Nakita ko po ang iba't ibang uri ng problema nararanasan nila sa kanilang pag-aaral araw-araw. 
sa trabaho bilang kalihim ng Department of Education. Kasama ko namang namumuhay ang mahigit sa 28 million Filipino learners sa buong bansa. At nakikita ko ang napakaraming problema ang hinaharap at binubuno nila sa kanilang pag-aaral araw-araw. For learners at home, over 28 million learners all over the Philippines. These, ladies and gentlemen, make my interest in the future of Philippine education a very personal matter. Filipino learners are not academically proficient. Oftentimes, Filipino learners experience emotional abuse and exhaustion. Some Filipino learners suffer from psychological fatigue. And being academically insecure, many of them fail to meet the standards of the demanding and competitive world. These are caused and triggered by conditions present at home, in our communities, and even in our schools as a result of problems ingrained in our system. This is the truth. Ito po ang katotohanan. Maukini ang kamatuuran sa dagway sa ato kaumaw. But this is a future we can change. And that is why we are all here. Let us remember that even in the face of death, Dr. Jose Rizal was the perpetual obstinate patriot as he was courageous and defiant before his firing squad executioners. Let us remember that Gabriela Silang, an Ilocano, was unshaken by the grief of widowhood and continued the revolution even after the death of her husband, Diego Silang. Let us remember that in Bohol, Francisco de Gohoy led the longest revolution in history. And let us remember that in Mininanao, the successful moral resistance was fortified by the unity forged between moral leaders across Mindanao and North Borneo by the great Sultan Kudarat. These are just a handful of Filipinos whose sacrifices change the course of our history as a people. They are Filipinos who demonstrated the indomitability of our spirit as a people. Our children are children of heroes. They are the descendants of Dr. Jose Rizal, Gabriela Silang, Francisco de Gohoy, and Sultan Kudarat. Our children are bound for greatness. Yes, it is necessary to emphasize that abilities are important to navigate life successfully. But our children must understand that hardships in life are not overcome by the best minds, hardships in life are overcome by the strongest hearts. Today is an opportunity for us to renew our commitment to our children and their future. Hard work, hard work, hard work. And only if you work the hardest will our children Fly, soar, fight, and win. This is the Basic Education Report 2023. The lack of school infrastructure and resources to support the ideal teaching process is the most pressing issue founding the Philippine Basic Education. 
the department is not blind to the reality that there is a need to build, repair, and maintain school infrastructure to accommodate the growing number of learners all over the Philippines. Today, there are over 28 million Filipino learners studying in public schools all over the Philippines. Our latest inventory shows we have 327,851 school buildings in the country. Out of these school buildings, only 104,536 are in good condition. Due to various reasons, there are also 100,027 school buildings that need minor repairs. 89,252 require major repairs and 21,727 are set for condemnation. Our schools are not calamity proof. Among the significant roadblocks to our education infrastructure program are earthquakes, typhoons, landslides, flooding, and even armed conflicts. In the Visayas alone, a total of 17,000 263 classrooms damaged by super typhoon events are still subject for repair and replacement. Last year in July, I personally visited Clarín National High School in Mohol, and in August, the Triana Elementary School in Limasawa Island in Southern Leyte. The destruction left by super typhoon events in these schools were heartbreaking raising the urgency for an appropriate action and collaboration between DepEd and education stakeholders from the local government units, the private sector, and international partners. In Triana Elementary School, a tent donated by an international aid agency has served as a temporary learning space. We need 9.82 billion for the repair and replacement of adept damaged classrooms in the Visayas alone. For 2023, the DepEd has allocated a total of 15.6 billion for new construction. Our assessments of the department's procurement practices showed cracks that if left unresolved will harm our vision to providing our learners with quality basic education. These procurement practices also illuminated the concern for transparency and accountability. Our assessment showed that the centralized procurement of DepEd has been hounded by delays in the submission of technical specifications, lack of updated guidelines, lack of qualified bidders, and low participation rates of prospective bidders. There were successful bidders who delivered on time, who failed to deliver on time, and worse, there were successful bidders who failed to make deliveries at all. The procurement practices at the Department of Education had red flags that demanded immediate actions. The creation of a separate strand dedicated entirely on matters of procurement was made to improve the system. This strand is ordered to ensure that delivery of services is done within the period required by law following the processes mandated by law. Our intention here is to solve a problem that has permeated within the system and ensure that transparency and accountability are present. As we confront the dilemma in school infrastructure and learning resources, we looked at the trends in our enrollments and learner data during the pandemic and now. We are implementing post-pandemic programs and reforms. After a significant decrease in enrollments in 2020 due to COVID-19 related school closures, enrollment has since started to recover. This year, we welcomed around 28.4 million learners in 44,931 public schools and 12,162 private schools nationwide. But 
Recovery in enrollment is limited only to public schools. We saw the decline of enrollment figures in private schools and eventually saw some private schools terminating their operations. From 2020 to 2022, more than 1,600 private schools stopped operations. Currently, the Department of Education is responsible for almost 80% of schools nationwide, of which 79% are elementary schools. Evidently, there is a wide disparity between the number of elementary and secondary schools in the country. With such a disparity, inclusivity in education remains to be a concern. Despite gains in bridging gaps, learners from indigenous people's communities, geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, Muslim youth, learners with disabilities, and out-of-school youth and adults still require the attention of the community. We need to improve their participation rates in basic education. The core of basic education is curriculum. The ongoing review of the K-12 curriculum has revealed that the curriculum content is congested, that some prerequisites of identified learning competencies are missing or misplaced, that a significant number of learning competencies cater to higher cognitive demands. For senior high school, our work immersion program has contributed to a high passing rate of 90% in the National Certificate Assessment administered by TESTA. However, industry partners have expressed concern that the time allotment for work immersion is only for familiarization and not for actual skills acquisition. Today, most senior high school graduates find the need to pursue higher education in order to find employment. The National Senior High School Tracer Study conducted by the Bureau of Curriculum Development showed that 83% of the respondents pursued higher education while only a little over 10% of graduates were employed. The K-12 curriculum promised to produce graduates that are employable. That promise remains a promise to this day. Our teachers, they are the lifeblood of the Department of Education. Without our teachers, our mission to carve a better future for our children will fail. Lagi ko pong sinasabi sa ating mga guru, importante kayo sa pag-unlad ng ating bayan. Kayo ang gumagabay at tumutulong sa ating mga kabataan sa pagpapanday ng kanilang mga pangarap sa buhay at sa pag sa katuparan ng mga pangarap na ito. And to empower our learners with the relevant skills and knowledge, we shall focus on upscaling your knowledge and capacities as public servants. The assessment on the K-12 curriculum revealed the weak teaching methods of our teachers in addressing 21st century skills. Studies done by the Research Center for Teacher Quality, the World Bank, and UNICEF showed that teachers need further support, particularly in explicitly and strategically teaching critical thinking and problem solving skills. While critical thinking was most evident in the curriculum, it was also the least taught to students by teachers. Instead, lessons leaned towards conceptual or content-based teaching, and lessons lacked in-depth processing to cultivate critical thinking and problem-solving. 
Finally, there appears to be insufficient knowledge on developing 21st century skills, including higher order thinking skills among learners. This is not the fault of our teachers, whose dedication, integrity, and the commitment to serve Filipino children and the country strengthened our collective effort to achieve our shared dreams for our learners. The sad reality is the system has failed them. This is a system that burdens them with backbreaking and time consuming administrative tasks. A system that provides no adequate support and robs them of the opportunity to professionally grow and professionally teach, assist, and guide our learners. Ladies and gentlemen, our teachers must return to our classrooms and they must teach. Another alarming issue that we must address appropriately and effectively is literacy. The 2018 study results of the Program for International Students Assessment, or PISA, are distressing, as it is alarming for me as a mother and as secretary of the Department of Education. The study results showed 81% of participating Filipino learners could not deal with basic math problems. 81% had trouble understanding texts of moderate length. And 78% would not recognize correct explanations for scientific phenomena or draw valid conclusions from given data. We can do better than this. And we Filipinos are better than this. But studies like these are opportunities for us to thoroughly examine our system and the defects that hurt our children's abilities. The current state of basic education behooves us all to take a courageous stand and cause us to work together with the intention and commitment to resolve the challenges in basic education. We fail, and our children will fail. In 2022, guided by its mandate and the renewed hope under the administration of President Marcos Jr., the Department of Education took steps towards education reforms. We brought our learners back to schools. On August 22, 2022, DepEd opened its doors to over 28 million learners across the nation. Today, 99.54% of our public schools are now implementing five-day in-person classes. We implemented the National Learning Recovery Plan to support the efforts of our field offices in addressing learning losses. Our road to recovery has begun with learning remediation and intervention programs. We continue to engage parents and legal guardians in facilitating learning and regularly conduct home visitations and follow-ups. We reskilled and upskilled teachers and school leaders. We have provided various capacity development initiatives to 226,367 teachers and school leaders. 15,331 teachers and school leaders received graduate scholarships. 17,636 were trained in early grade language literacy. 161,700 teachers completed NAAP subsidized teaching courses and 31,700 have undergone teacher induction program. We started the review of the curriculum. As we speak, the revised kindergarten to grade 10 curriculum is being finalized. We have also started the review of the senior high school curriculum. We have taken small steps, and we need to take more. The Department of Education, under the Marcos administration, 
guided by the Philippine Constitution, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Sustainable Development Goals, reaffirms our commitment to improving the quality of basic education in the country. We know that the road will be bumpy, but our direction is clear. We know that the challenges are vast, but we, Filipinos, are resilient. We will overcome. Tayo po ay magiging matatag. Tungo sa isang bansang makabata at batang makabansa. I present to you our education agenda. Lahat tayo gustong makatulong sa pamilya at sa bayan. Lahat tayo maaasahan. Lahat tayo gagawa. Lahat tayo tutulong. Lahat tayo didiskarte at ilikha para sa ating kinabukasan. Dahil lahat tayo ay may pangarap, may gustong abutin, may lais marating. At kahit pa humarap sa libu-libong hamon ng buhay, ang tatag ng lahat Pilipino, mamingibabaw, susulong, tayo ay magiging matatag. Matatag na kurikulum, matatag na paaralan, at aga ng servisyo para sa edukasyon. Matatag na programa sa mag-aaral at kabataan. Matatag na suporta para sa mga guro. Ang ating pangarap, maaamot, mararating, basta tulong-tulong. Magsisipag tayo. Magsisikap tayo. Para sa isang bansang makabata. Para sa makabansa. Lahat tayo. Lahat tayo. Lahat tayo. Matatag ang pangarap. Matatag ang kinabukasan. Sa gitna ng hamon sa edukasyon, tayo po ay magiging matatag. First, we will make the curriculum relevant to produce competent, job-ready, active, and responsible citizens. We will revise the K-12 curriculum to make them more responsive to our aspiration as a nation. To develop lifelong learners who are imbued with 21st century skills, discipline, and patriotism. We will reduce the number of learning areas in K-3 to from 7 to 5 to focus on foundational skills in literacy and numeracy in early grades, particularly among disadvantaged students. We will strengthen our literacy and numeracy programs. We will revitalize our reading, science and technology and math programs by utilizing the gains of previous programs. The programs will be benchmarked with local and international best practices, consulted with experts, and will be research or evidence-based. We will improve English proficiency while recognizing linguistic diversity. We will work towards the goal of English language proficiency within the context of a multilingual nation. We will review the implementation of the mother tongue-based multilingual education policy guided by the basic principle that, among others, learners learn when taught in a language that they understand. We will further intensify the values formation of learners in curriculum and teaching, particularly through the good manners and right conduct and values education in adherence to Republic Act 11476. We will embed the culture of peace in our curriculum to develop learners who are peace builders in communities. 
we will integrate these competencies such as social awareness, responsibility, care for the environment, value for diversity, self-esteem, positive character, resilience, and human security into the various learning areas of the K-12 curriculum. We will be transparent with curriculum guides. We will share our draft curriculum with interested education stakeholders to help us develop a robust curriculum. We will be transparent about our test scores. We will make our test data available for researchers and analysts to aid us in making evidence-based policy decisions. We will share sample test items with schools and teachers to strengthen the use of assessments to improve the teaching and learning process. We will engage with CHED and TESTA and various industry partners to address the issues of skills mismatch in our senior high school program. And we will need your help to make our graduates employable. We appeal to the industry and to employers to accept our students in work immersions and hire them when they graduate. Secondly, we will take steps to accelerate the delivery of basic education facilities and services. We have recently created the School Infrastructure and Facilities Strand. This strand will be devoted entirely to addressing long-standing issues on educational facilities and infrastructure. We will build more resilient schools and classrooms for 2023, we have the budget to build around 6,000 classrooms. We commit to closing the remaining gaps in school infrastructure with policies to eliminate corruption and insulate the allocation of school building funds with politicization. We will establish fully functional library hubs in our division offices. We will provide schools with electricity. In the next five years, we will work towards providing electricity, especially in our last, last mile schools. We will provide e-classroom packages for teaching and learning. Each package will consist of 46 laptops, two charging cards, two wireless routers, and one smart TV. This will accelerate the integration of ICT in teaching and learning and institutionalize the blended learning program. We will optimize the use of technology, both online and offline, to ensure that learners have opportunities to learn even in the events of a pandemic or other emergencies. We will digitize our essential processes, including our national assessments. We will launch our national education portal, or NEP, which will provide a dynamic one-stop shop platform available to all basic education stakeholders, such as teachers, learners, and parents. The NEP will substantially cut down the manual process, reduce transaction costs, and eliminate errors due to human intervention. We will strengthen the complementarity between public and private schools through the seamless implementation of the government assistance and subsidies program of the DepEd with the creation of the voucher program management office. Working with private school organizations, we will also speed up the issuance of the revised manual of regulation for private schools. We will work closely with Congress in pushing for the expansion of gospel coverage to include kindergarten and elementary learners. For our Barm brothers, sisters, and learners, we will always make ourselves available to provide technical expertise. We will fully support your school building program and GASPE direction. The Department of Education is not without legal problems, but we will cooperate with government agencies 
for a swift and truthful resolution of these issues. Effective education governance is crucial in accelerating the achievement of education outcomes. Next, we will take good care of learners by promoting learner well-being, inclusive education, and a positive learning environment. As part of our national statement of commitment in the Transforming Education Summit, the DepEd reaffirms its pledge to ensure that all school-age children and youth and adults in situations of disadvantage are participating in inclusive basic learning opportunities and receiving appropriate quality education. We will undertake initiatives to provide schooling to many more children and youth in situations of disadvantage regardless of gender, abilities, psycho-emotional and physical conditions, cultural and religious identity, and socio-economic standing. We will strengthen and institutionalize the reintegration program for adolescent mothers, children at risk, and children in conflict with the law by developing inclusive models and mechanisms applicable to both formal and non-formal learning. We will continue to strengthen the mechanism in safeguarding our learners against all forms of discrimination and dangers. Our Learners' Rights and Protection Office has been acting on reported cases ranging from all kinds of bullying, many forms of abuse, corporal punishment, discrimination, and child neglect. We will improve our learning environments to encourage support, discourage bullying, strengthen the implementation of child protection policies, make students feel safe and respected, and make them, including our indigenous people's learners and those with disabilities, feel that they belong. We commit to seeking out mental wellness experts to form inter interventions at the school level. We will also ensure that all learners have access to relevant guidance and psychosocial services managed and delivered by mental health professionals. To achieve this, we will work with the Department of Budget and Management to obtain higher salary grades for guidance counselors and propose the creation of additional items that will focus on providing learner support services, including guidance-related services in schools. We will strengthen our inclusive education programs, including the alternative learning system, class by schools, and programs for IP learners and learners with disabilities. We will endeavor that all learners, no matter what, their backgrounds are, will be afforded quality learning opportunities and services. We will continue with the establishment of inclusive learning resource centers for our learners with special needs. We will provide assessment assistive mechanisms such as audio assistive technology, braille, and large print test materials to students with disabilities. We will introduce digital textbooks for certain core subjects in senior high school. We will work with the regional offices and our partners to facilitate the development of learning resources for special needs learners, specifically our visually and hearing impaired learners. We will work with legislators and local government units through the Literacy Coordinating Council to eradicate illiteracy at the city, municipal, and barangay levels through relevant policy issuances and community literacy program interventions. We will involve our parents and guardians in the education of our children. Finally, we will give support to teachers to teach better. Teachers are critical to the success of education. When they are supported, education quality improves. 
We will continuously provide professional development programs, including graduate degree scholarship programs to teachers, focusing on their learning area specialization and graduate certificate programs for non-majors. We will provide support in terms of innovative, responsive, and inclusive teaching approaches following the Philippine professional standards for teachers. We will capacitate our teachers and learners in utilizing technology in remote learning to maximize the benefits of digital learning. We will provide training and other learning and development interventions for school leaders, namely the school heads, supervisors, superintendents, and assistant superintendents, so that they can better support our teachers to teach better. We will remove non-teaching tasks and provide administrative officers in schools. We will provide adequate manpower complement in schools manage teachers' workload, and compensate teachers for unique school challenges. We will fast track the implementation of the career progression policy so teachers get more opportunities for promotion. We will strictly implement the merit selection policy so that human resource recruitment, selection, and appointment to vacant positions in the DepEd are based on key knowledge, skills, attitude, and desired behaviors, and not due to any form of intervention from other government personnel or similar entities outside of the Department of Education. Within a year, we aim to make the new Teacher Education Council and Secretariat fully functional and start working on its mandates, including setting minimum requirements for pre-service teacher education programs in the country. We will continuously advocate for additional benefits for our teachers. We will implement the policy on the distribution of teacher workload and payments of teaching overload, as provided in the Magna Carta for public school teachers. We have also requested the Department of Budget and Management to expand the coverage for the grant of special hardship allowance. We will work towards addressing issues affecting the net take-home pay of teachers. We are discussing with the Department of Health for the provision of free annual physical examinations for our teachers. We are also closely coordinating with the GSIS for an improved and superior benefits package for all DepEd personnel. We will resolve issues on teachers' loans, premium remittances, and other benefits. We have committed to meeting at least once a month until these issues are resolved. Lastly, we are looking to provide free legal assistance facility for teachers on matters concerning loan contracts obligations, and cases. To our teachers, we recognize your zeal, integrity, commitment, and passion. And yes, we also recognize your sacrifices. We thank you for your sacrifices. Maraming salamat po sa inyong dedikasyon. Hindi po namin kayo papagulyaan. Agenda. This is our roadmap. This is our commitment. Now, please allow me to introduce the team that will see to it that all these commitments and more are met. Please stand as I call your name, but do not clap because they have not produced work yet. <laughs> After six years, we will all gather here together and clap for them. Curriculum and teaching strand. 
Undersecretary Gina Gora. Assistant Secretary Alma Rubitorio. Assistant Secretary G.H. Ambat. Please remain standing. Human Resource and Organizational Development Strand, Undersecretary Gloria Humamil Mercado. Operations Strand, Undersecretary Rev. C. Escobedo. Assistant Secretary Francis Cesar Bringas. Assistant Secretary Dr. Dexter Galvar. School Infrastructure and Facilities Strand or we call him the classroom czar inside the DepEd. Undersecretary Abimaco Lensi III. Legal and Legislative Affairs Strand, Undersecretary Jose Arturo de Castro. Assistant Secretary Amanda Marino Gales. Administration Strand, Undersecretary Christian Aguilar. Assistant Secretary Christopher Lawrence Arduco. Finance Strand, Undersecretary Adeline Sevilla. Procurement Strand, Undersecretary Gerard Chan. Assistant Secretary Omar Alexander Romero. And the Attorney Michael Wesley Howard. Today, Dep Ed stands before you, heart in hand, humbly seeking your support, improving access, equity, quality, resiliency, and well-being will not happen overnight, nor can it be done by Dep Ed alone. We need a national commitment and sustained effort from all sectors of the society. Together, we will rally for an improved learning system in the country. Together, we will rally for every Filipino child. Para sa isang matatag na bayan. Para sa ating mahal na Pilipinas. Ang lahat para sa Diyos, sa bayan, at bawat pamilya Pilipino. Thank you, Mama. At this point, may we invite the President and the Vice President to sign the Matatak Commitment Wall on stage. We would also like to ask our distinguished guests on stage to stand and witness the commitment signing.
Thank you, President Marcos, Vice President Duterte, and the rest of the stage party. And congratulations to the Department of Education. This juncture, may we invite once again the Vice President and Concurrent Education Secretary to introduce our keynote speaker. May I request everyone to please rise. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of the Philippines, His Excellency Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Thank you very much uh, to our Vice President and the Secretary of Education, please, please sit down. Uh, Secretary of Education, uh, and uh, we thank you very much for that uh, most thorough and insightful report. Uh, and it gives us certainly a baseline. It may not be the best news. Uh, that we had hoped to receive, but nonetheless, it shows us the directions in which we need to go. Uh, Senate President uh, Ming Sugiri, the other members of the Senate who are here today, uh, the Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Cabinet, the Chair of the Senate Committee on Basic Education, Senator Sherwin Gachalian, Pasay City Mayor Imelda Calixto Rubiano, Basic Education and Culture Chairman, Congressman Roman Romano, and the other members of the House of Representatives, my fellow workers in government, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is an honor to join you today for the first part of the Basic Education Report. And it is particularly important, as we were noting during this, whilst the Senate, while the Vice President was speaking, that this has been the first conference of this kind for many, many years. And uh, it is necessary, we it absolutely necessary that we have such consultations for the simple reason that we all know, must, must know the situation that we face and the many problems that we need, that we need to solve. And uh, only again by working together can we get that, that, that job done. But at least the uh, Department of Education, the Secretary uh, in Daisala, our Vice President, has provided us with this starting point. And it is now up to us to take that starting point and start, go from that starting point and to all, all the programs that we hope to implement in the very near future for our children. I think that uh, if there is one thing that we took from the comments of uh, the Secretary, uh, Secretary Vice President in Daisala, is that the Filipino is better than this. The children are better than this. And we can it. And that is the main motivation that we should keep in our hearts. We have failed. We have to admit that. We have failed our children. And let us not keep failing them anymore. Otherwise, we will not allow them to become the great Filipinos that we know they can be. They will not become the great Filipinos that will be recognized not only by their fellow Filipinos, by but many people around the world. And thus, it, is, it once again reminds us that education is the most valuable service that the government can give to its citizens. If there is nothing else, after preservation of life and limb, education comes next. And with that, with a well-trained, with a well-trained public, with a well-trained and a well, uh, highly experienced workforce, then everything follows. The Philippines will succeed. So we in the administration recognize the challenges and issues facing our education sector. 
all of which must be confronted with an open mind and compassion for those who might have fallen behind over the past two years. I am confident that we will see noticeable improvements moving forward because our Department of Education that is spearheaded by no less than our hard-working Vice President in Daisada Duterte is there. Let me also acknowledge and convey my deepest appreciation to the men and women of DepEd who are uh, now in the hot seat because of pinakilala na kayo, hindi in Daisara sa aming lahat, kaya pagka magka problema, alam na namin kung sinong nanapita namin. Uh, but all of you, the associations, the country policy makers, the development partners, and all stakeholders for your collective efforts and commitment to pursuing quality education for all. I am pleased to see that you have gathered here for this very important event for the benefit of our learners. Your attendance is a manifestation that addressing our educational challenges requires not only a multifaceted approach, but also the active participation of all. It is my hope that my being here signals this administration's determination and commitment to bridge the gaps that currently exist in the education sector. Indeed, strengthening our education system warrants a whole of government, whole of society approach with the highest degree of proactivity, motivation, and perseverance. As our nation recovers and bounces back from the losses and adverse effects caused by COVID-19, we must, we must now move full speed to equip our learners and educators with the capacity and the potentialities of the Filipino worker and of the Philippines. And at every juncture, I am confronted by the challenge of that the central key to success is going to upskill and reskill our workforce. And that again brings us to the importance of education, not only as a moral, not only as a, a moral imperative for government, but as a practical one. Because without that skilled workforce, we cannot compete and we cannot succeed. So I'm gratified to see that that has become a very large part of the plans that the DepEd has for the future. The pandemic also brought to our consciousness the importance of being able to adapt to new and changing realities, as well as unexpected circumstances. So again, we must consistently develop and adopt innovative paradigms and strategic reforms that will ensure the resilience of our educational landscape. We must first act locally in order for us to be competitive globally. We will work hard so that no Filipino is left behind. And to do even better, we will ensure that we are at par with the global standards in basic education. This endeavor will be at the forefront of our efforts to realize our vision of providing quality education for our children and for generations to come. I have previously mentioned that this administration will at no point scrimp on investment in our education in our sector and in our young learners. And I am here today to reaffirm that commitment. We will build infrastructure. We will build infrastructure that will provide our learners, teachers, and the entire academic sector with a healthy and safe environment that is conducive to learning. We will also invest in our teachers. As we all know, that is part of the most, uh, uh, that is part of our improving our educational system. If you saw the Senate President and myself talking earlier, we are already planning on how we get the school building program off the ground so that these deficiencies that we saw in the report will somehow be mitigated. Our teachers, our teachers are there for, for because it is a vocation. Teachers do not become teachers because it is their job. 
Teachers do not become teachers because they want to become rich. Teachers become teachers because they have to. It is a vocation. And it is up to us to support them in that effort because it, they, they feel the need to educate young people. And we are blessed that we have such teachers and we should hold them, hold them close and do all we can to support them so that they can do to the best of their ability what they have pledged to do. So we invest in our teachers. We offer them, we will offer them multiple opportunities that meet both their personal and professional needs. We will offer them the support they need in terms of resources, in terms of programs and policies so that they can effect Perform, effectively perform the roles as teachers and mentors of our children. It is my firm belief that quality teachers yield hard-working, productive, and law-abiding citizens. We will also invest in our learners by giving them the right tools and mechanisms that they need in their day-to-day -day schooling. Let us take advantage of the new technologies and innovations that will provide them convenience and efficiency in their pursuit of learning. Aside from advancing their academic competencies, it is also imperative that we hone them to become productive and responsible members of our society. Let us embrace the DEPST and find what it is. Bansan makabata, batang makabansa. In that way, we can produce young citizens who are not only productive, but also harbor genuine love and passion for our country. That is why I have always been consistent in expressing my full support to the DEPS plans to take critical, bold, yet sustainable action that will improve our country's educational sector and address learning challenges. It is something that I have been espousing throughout my entire professional career. And at every position that I have ever held, the very first uh, the very first action I ever took was always to find a way to help our teachers. I know the conditions that they have to work in, I know the difficulties that they have to face, and yet they come to school and look after our children. That is a blessing. So I stand behind you as we come up with a long-term vision and forward-thinking solution that will benefit our children. I would like to emphasize, however, that government does not, is not able to execute this task alone. As I said earlier, strengthening our education system warrants the support of each one of us that are present here today. All of us have roles to play. We have parts to contribute. And so, let me issue a challenge to you all to become active key players in this effort. Let us join hands and act in unison as we build the best education system that the Philippines has ever seen. We owe it to our children to prioritize their well-being and give them the highest possible quality of education so they may become the innovators and the leaders of tomorrow, not only of the Philippines, but of the world. With our united efforts, I am confident that we will succeed and bring forth a better, brighter, more prosperous future for our children. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. Thank you, Mr. President. At this point, we do request the President to kindly grant us a group photo with all our attendees.
program. Thank you, Mr. President, for gracing the event this afternoon.